All right, welcome back to from lunch. We are gonna have a Q&A time. And um, instead of passing the microphone around, I'm gonna have, I'm just gonna run it to you and I'm just gonna be the one that holds it so we don't have to pass uh, germs around. So we're just gonna try to do it like that. But uh, we'll try to get as many questions as we can and we'll just give you liberty. If you feel led to go in a certain direction to answer a certain direction, you just feel, you know, it's really, however you want to handle the time. So we can kind of go as fast or as slow on questions as we want, but we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can, so. Um, so, um, we'll just open it up. Does anybody have any questions? Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question about the statement on critical race theory that the Southern Baptists put out recently. Uh, you're probably aware of that. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you think that that was the right move to make or if it was premature or there's obviously been some blowback from some African American pastors and some have even left the association over it. So what are your thoughts on that statement and whether or not putting it out was a great idea or not? Good question. Uh, so the question is related to critical race theory. How many of you know what critical race theory is all about? Most people are probably like you, because it keeps changing, you know, what the definition is and what it means. Um, and the Southern Baptists uh, voted at their last convention or convention before that, I think it was Article 9, um, to uh, allow critical race theory or use critical race theory and intersectionality as a hermeneutic principle for interpreting scriptures. So my theological response would be to put to that would be, no way, Jose. Um, um, critical race theory and intersectionality are social constructs. They are not theological constructs. And therefore, uh, we must look at the, lens, look at the scriptures um, and interpret them in the context in which they're given, in the times in which they're given, um, so we use scripture as a lens to look at culture. We don't lose, use culture as a lens to look at scripture. So it's basically the idea of I don't look at culture and then run to the Bible. I look at the Bible and then I look at culture. And that should be our format for how we um, um, interpret the scriptures and how we use the scriptures and using the hermeneutical principles that have been given to us and handed down through time. Um, I'm kind of like John MacArthur. Anything new is probably not biblical. Uh, and, and I know there can be an extreme to that, but uh, you know the Bible constantly tells us and reminds us that, especially 2 Timothy chapter 2 reminds us, we're just handing down what has been handed to us, and we're handing it down to the next generation, that generation hands it to the next generation. So if you're just handing off what's previously been handed, why would you be coming up with something new? So it's the apostles' teachings, it's the apostles' doctrine that we are handing from one generation to the next generation to the next generation to the next generation. But when you get people who are wolves dressed in sheep clothing, when you understand that Paul is constantly, and Peter is constantly, and Jude constantly reminds you of the danger of false teachers, inside the church and outside the church, then you understand why we're getting a lot of these different viewpoints that are not traditionally been the viewpoints of our scripture and how we interpret the scriptures. Because you have an enemy that's trying to infiltrate the camp and bringing in counterfeit things. And so you have to have discernment to know what's what. You know, many of you, you guys are students and you are pastors, you know that Paul in Acts 20 warns the elders at Miletus that People will come in among you from the outside and be among you and attacking you and teaching things they should not be teaching to lead disciples after themselves. Well, if they were doing that then, guess what? They're doing it now. And the problem is we don't have enough men of God and, and, and women of God in the context of members, but we don't have leaders that are able to discern what's what and help warn the flock to say, watch out, watch out. This is, this is not of God. This is not true to Scripture. And that's why I said earlier, we need men with courage in the pulpit. And um, you guys teach pastoral theology here? 
uh, if I were teaching pastoral theology, I would not start with 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. I would start with 2 Corinthians. For 2 Corinthians is about what is New Covenant ministry. And New Covenant ministry is a ministry of suffering. And who is adequate for these things? No one unless God makes them adequate. New Covenant ministry, New Testament ministry is a ministry of suffering. It's not a, a ministry of celebrity ship. It's not a ministry of notoriety where you got books on the top five bestsellers. It's a ministry of suffering. That's what New Testament ministry is. And I don't think we're developing men consistently, and I don't want to generalize too much, but just in my understanding, my experience, I don't really think we're developing men who really understand what New Covenant and New Testament ministry is really all about. It's a ministry of suffering. It's not a ministry of going, you know, I went to a Southern Baptist seminary, and um, in my experience, uh, I heard many conversations around lunch tables and hallway conversations where guys weren't even at seminary to learn about ministry. What they understood because of the culture of the Southern Baptist ministry, you go nowhere if you don't have a degree. So I'm here to get a degree. I don't even agree with half the stuff that's being taught here. But I have to have a degree, and I've already mapped up, I want to go to this church, this church, this church, and get to that church. That was the motivation for a lot of people that I heard that were in my classrooms at the time I was going to seminary. But on the other realm, the National Baptist, which is more of a, the black side of, of, of ministry, you don't even need a degree to be in ministry. So there's two extremes. You know you got to have a degree to be in ministry over here. There's no, not necessarily any need for a degree over here. You can just say you believe you're called, and that's it. And you could be saved this Sunday and be called the pastor the next Sunday. That's what I grew up under. And even I, as a young kid, knew there was something wrong with that. You know, and so uh, if you have that type of thing going on, then we come up with all these other ways of interpreting the Bible. And Satan is attacking the church, and that's really, all this stuff is just distraction to keep us off the main agenda of fulfilling the Great Commission. But it takes discernment to know what's what. So that's how I would answer that question. So critical race theory, intersectionality, are not to be used as biblical ways of interpreting scripture. The old, true, hermeneutical principles that we've been taught and been handed down for years and generations is the biblical way to interpret Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. So, I am not a proponent of critical race theory or intersectionality, if you can't tell, at all. It's a social construct. It's not a theological or biblical construct. Does that answer your question? And what's the other one? Specifically, too, I'm wondering about the response from the seminary presidents in which they basically denied critical race theory and said, we don't, we don't teach that, we don't want to use that. Uh, was that a, a necessary and useful response, or was that uh, just being too combative? Saying they didn't want to use that? Yeah, I think that, that was very wise to make that declaration to draw that line in the sand, um, because it's not biblical traditional hermeneutics. So therefore, for them to make that statement is a good stand to take. Because it's a social construct, it's a cultural construct, it's fairly new and fairly recent, it's not a biblical construct. So they're taking that stand and opposing that decision by some of the pastors, some of them have even left the Southern Baptist Convention, is a good stand, in my biblical, humble observation. The question. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I almost want to say, forgive me for asking this question, but you were mentioning earlier various ethnic ministries starting in your church, mm -hmm. and then you're talking about us all being one. Mm -hmm. I kind of would like to anticipate your answer, but. Um, Go ahead. 
Well, okay, I can understand some of the pragmatism of it, mm -hmm. but somewhere along the line, all those various ethnic ministries need to also realize we're all one. Mm -hmm. So how are we working toward that? Well, I, I can understand the theological framework, but I understand that many of my immigrant and international brothers don't understand the framework because, for example, in the church that uh, meets in our building, they're basically refugees from Nepal. They have a caste system. And so you have an upper class, middle class, lower caste system, and they don't even integrate among themselves. Okay? Uh, we have the one Nepali pastor who meets in our church who's a part of the lower caste system. Uh, at one time, we were approached by another Nepali church about using space in our building because that kind of word is out in our community about our church. But they were a part of the upper caste system. Well, I have some friends who work with these people every day. Another ministry works with these people every day. So I called them up, to add, and, and they really were referring to group. I said, well, what are the problems here that I may not be aware of that could be problems that could blindside us if we take this group in. And then he explained to me more about the caste system and I got a greater understanding of caste system. And the group that was meeting with us that I've developed a bond with, who kind of sees me, I'm not their pastor, but they see me as their pastor. So they kind of adopted me. Uh, and that's just the way that works in their viewpoint. Would have been hurt and offended if we had invited this other group in because this other group, which was a higher caste system, would have looked down upon them as a lower caste system, and they would have felt that I was betraying them by bringing in this higher caste system group. So we as leaders decided that we did not want to do that to them. We did not want to offend them. So we voted not to, and then we agreed not to allow this other church to meet in our building because we didn't want them to feel offended and rejected and think we didn't love them. And it, and it is so still ingrained that even though we're here in America, they're divided up by neighborhoods and can't even move into each other's neighborhood because that would be a sign of disrespect and they would be rejected if they were to do that. So it's still ingrained in them. And so in ministering to them, we have to teach them about the unity we have in Christ because they don't understand that yet. So when I'm working with them or teaching them anything, I normally teach them about unity and this identif common identification we have in Christ. So it is, that right there tells you it's not a skin problem. Because they look like each other, and they come from the same part of the world, but they're as divided as the black and whites are in America. And so, but, and I would never be able to minister to them if they weren't a part of, of working in our building. And so, um, I've had to make some cultural adjustments myself. Now, my lovely little wife, who you guys are all love because everybody loves her. They tolerate me, but they love her. Um, she likes the experimentation of eating different foods. I want to know what it is, what's in it, and where did it come from. I need to do some exegetical hermeneutical on the recipes before I eat this, you know. But I've had to make adjustments. I've had, because we go and we have dinner. That's one of the ways they show their love and their they're, they're, that familiar, that kinship, is they invite us over to dinner. And when they have meals, and I mean they have meals. Before COVID, they would have meals. I mean, they cook all night. And it doesn't smell like anything that any of you are familiar with. And the aroma goes throughout the building. And so they want to share their food with us because they consider us family. But I'm eating stuff, I don't know what it is. Are you feeling me? That's why God didn't make me a missionary. I don't eat stuff, and I don't know what it is. But I had to what? Put my preference aside to show love and respect to my brothers and sisters in Christ. So now I'm over at their house, and whatever they sit in front of me, I'm eating. And it's spicy. It's really, really spicy. It's the kind of spicy that stays with you a couple of days. <laughs> And my wife's loving this thing, and she's just loving it. And she don't care what it is. Me? God, I need your spirit right now. Please help me. <laughs> but this is how they show love. This is how they show, hey, 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 you're, you're a part of us, and we're a part of you. And so people say, well, if, we're not, if you're not all meeting together, is that really multi-ethnic ministry? 
one size does not fit all. I'm not saying that you have to have everybody in your church to be, but you have to be doing something where you're crossing those lines and developing relationships and breaking down false, false stereotypes and false misconceptions. And that might look different for all of us, but it's still got to be intentional, whatever, however we do it. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, just to summarize, I think what you're saying is you had to start somewhere. Yes. Yes. And, and I had to make some changes. To where now, uh, I've taught vacation Bible school, and, and these people are, are dedicated in loving the Lord and learning of the Lord. Because it, it costs them to follow Jesus. Because most, most of them come out of Hindu and Buddhist backgrounds. Their families at home have disowned them. Some of them even have Buddhist priests who have disowned them. So in America, they're all they have. And we're all they have. But being open to that and, and being willing to eat at the table with them and to break bread with them has allowed me to help the pastors who are not as sound theologically and have not had the privilege of going to Bible college. I now can train them. And so we meet on Saturdays and I, and I train them in pastoral leadership and help them with pastoral things that they don't even know about because they don't have the training I have. And so it's opened up doors for me to work with the pastors and then they're better able to work with their congregation but also I've taught vacation Bible school to their people, and they come during the day and pack the room out. But I'm teaching, and he's translating, which is really hard for me because I talk really fast, and I have a lot to say. But I had to learn to slow down so he could translate. So I've had to make adjustments. But for me, it was not about my comfort. It was about how do we glorify God in this situation? How do we bridge this gap to show the commonality we have in Christ. So you have to make adjustments. But it's about love, and love drives the whole thing. It's about we're one in Christ, and we got to demonstrate that illustration to them and to the world, and not say, come in and be like us. Now, every fifth Sunday before COVID, we have a joint service with all the churches. That's a sight to behold, because everybody's speaking in their own language. We had a pastor on staff, and I was talking with Dr. Brown. We had a pastor on staff, Caucasian gentleman, who was a missionary who understood the cultural nuances. He would coordinate that. So we got five screens, four or five screens in the sanctuary with every language on the screen. Each group would sing songs in their language. And then the message was done in English, and then they would translate the message to their people while they were sitting in the pews. That's how we did the service because I don't have the gift of tongues, biblical or unbiblical. <laughs> and so we figured out that's how we had to do it. And so it, 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 was, it was amazing to see what has happened because relationships are now being built. So our Hispanic brothers and sisters, the, the women would bring, um, they normally come to the service with their heads covered. And so they would buy head coverings for people in our church and give them to them. And so our people would come and bring and wear the hair companies every time we met together. The Nepali dress in very colorful clothes. And there would have been such relations built between the members of our church and their churches that they would buy clothes for our people, and then our people would wear those clothes whenever we met together. So we're not all in the same body every Sunday. But there's that unity and oneness being built anyway. And, that, and that's how we figure how we had to do it. Now, you got to figure out how God wants you to do it, but you got to do it. Because it's not a one-size-fits-all strategy. But the intentionality is absolutely necessary and biblical. Does that make sense, everybody? So you got to figure out how God wants you to do it. Yes? So I know one of your uh, pursuing diversity and leadership. So how do you balance, say, the diversity goals with, like, qualifications and the other, the other how, do you, how do you balance that with all the other requirements for leadership? Uh, very easy. I don't. The biblical qualifications are unnegotiable. The biblical qualifications are un unnegotiable. So we don't compromise the biblical qualifications just to attain diversity and unity, or multi-ethnic picture. 
Because you can't compromise the Bible. You compromise on your preferences. You never compromise doctrine. So that's not a problem because even with the churches that meet in our building, they have to be in the same doctrinal framework that we're in or we don't partner with them. So we don't compromise doctrine just so we can reflect multi-ethnic unity. So if you're a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church or some other church, and we could all debate about that, you would probably never be using um, rooms in our building for that because that would mean we'd be compromising where we stand doctrinally. Um, so if you've been married five times and that's okay in your culture, we would not compromise on that because that would be compromising biblical doctrine. So we get everybody's doctrinal statement who wants to use our building, we go through that and see if it lines up. If it doesn't line up, we politely say, no, we don't think we can do this. If it does line up, then we move from there. So there is no compromise, there is no struggle when it comes to that issue. Did that answer your question? I'm Bible. I'm Bible first. Uh, it's not unity at the sacrifice of doctrine. Um, and so this is wisdom and, strategy and, and you know, discernment based on the scriptures. Yes? So we talk a lot about like the solution, both in meetings like this and also in churches, you know, solutions for these problems, things like that. Um, you made a call in one of your in one of your um, messages this morning for repentance, both by individual believers and by the church. Um, and I guess my question is just, what would you say is the problem? Because we talk so much about these solutions. We talk so much about, you know, we need to repent. We need to be moving forward. But what is the problem, and how does that practically show up in our churches? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the first problem is uh, we're listening to too many of the wrong voices. Number one, and what I mean by that, you have to understand in the biblical context of the first century that the epistles are constantly dealing with the dangers of false teaching and false teachers infiltrating the church. False leaders, false prophets, false teachers is a constant danger throughout the epistles. Okay? God never calls anyone to ministry and gives them a wrong message. So it's easy to evaluate when they're called by God, how does their message line up with the message that we're supposed to be proclaiming? Then does their character line up with the character that God says they should have if he called them to proclaim the message? Well, we got people with messed up character coming up with critical race theory and intersectionality and all these other things, but we don't use the Bible to measure whether we shouldn't be listening to the message. It's very clear in Scripture that whoever God calls, he gives them the message. You're an ambassador. You're one sent with a message. You don't come up with a message. See, it was very easy in the first century to tell if a person had done their job as an ambassador if the king sent them to a foreign dignitary. If the message was a message that the king knows should have got him his head chopped off or him put in prison and he comes back, guess what the king knows? You didn't communicate my message. If it was meant to be a message of goodwill and peace and you come back and they want to come now attack you, guess what the king knows? You didn't communicate my message. Well, we're ambassadors of Christ, not ambassadors like in Washington. We're ambassadors who are sent with a message we have the word of reconciliation. We have the message of reconciliation. We have the message and we have the word. Don't come up with a message. Proclaim what you were sent to proclaim. And verse 21 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us what, what the ultimate goal is. He who knew no sin was made sin, but we who, I'm paraphrasing, who knew no righteousness were made righteous. That's the essence of the message. And that person is Christ. The person is Christ. How many pastors we have in the room? Let me love on you for a quick minute. Pastors got a tough job. It's a tough calling. Because most of your people are Costco-minded people. Sam's Club. 
They think you exist for them. And when they walk into the store of your church on Sunday, you ought to have everything on the shelf that meets every need and every desire they have in their little hearts and their little minds. See, your people and my people aren't just listening to you. They're listening to the person on the television. They're listening to the person on the radio. They're listening to the person on their job. They're listening to their mama, their daddy, their brother, their sister. They listen to everybody but the pastor. And what they do that you don't know they're doing is they take what you say and go home and have barbecue pastor around the table or at the restaurant and debate about what you're saying compared to all the voices they're listening to. And then they determine which one they like better. Welcome to pastoring. Welcome to pastor. I, I'm very blessed. And so um, that's one. The other thing is we, we have to start having these conversations with open Bibles in front of us. This is why I'm constantly saying, turn here, let's look at this. I even have a text that I was going to read in James chapter 2 about the royal law of love and how we're violating that by showing partiality. James calls it the royal law of love. To love your neighbor, not to look upon somebody just by and determine something about them and determine where they're going to sit or what place you're going to put them in the church based on how they look on the outside. Showing partiality, he says, is sin. Third, until we start dealing with this problem as sin and not social, then the Bible has nothing to say about it. James calls it sin. We call it social, psychological, hysterical about our history. See, that's why the gospel, the principles of the gospel are the solution, because if it's sin, then it's the principle of the gospel that can deal with sin. Sociology can't deal with sin. Cultural nuances can't deal with sin. Only the gospel deals with sin. So is racism sin, or is it a psychological, sociological history problem? And if it's sin, I got your solution. If it's all those other things, we can all debate about what the solutions are. So those are the top three lists of problems and why we can't deal with it and what we need to do as a church. You gotta, you gotta, James says it's sin. The Bible says it's sin. But we're, dealing, we're trying to deal with it sociologically. We're trying to deal with it Psychologically, we're trying to deal with it. Culturally, we're trying to deal with it. Denominationally, we're trying to deal with it. Only the cross can deal with sin. So is it sin or is it something else? And if it's sin, the Bible's got the solution. If it's all these other things, then we'll all come up with different ideas about how to address the problem. And we'll be 200 years from now down this same road talking about it but never getting anything done about it. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, you're not going to hear this everywhere. There will be people you'll bring in here who may totally disagree with me. But I'm hoping that the Spirit and the Word of God will be your guide and not the person talking. A little follow-up to that, see if I can make sense of my question here. So... Repentance language. So language of repentance is personal, specific, but in a lot of situations, the problem is uh, people would say, I'm not, to use the, the term, I'm not racist, but it's abstract, it's not an accurate term. In their own minds, they're not faced with, say, a rural church in America, they're not faced with situations, so they don't see themselves that way. But based upon uh, their, their humor or generalizations, or you know, if, if one of their children were to bring someone home for dinner <laughs> mm-hmm. type situation, it would surface. So it's underneath the surface, but it's abstract up in their head, but it's not mm-hmm. inaccurate. But if you try to bring it to the surface, then as a leader, you're accused of being sociologically woke, or you're trying to adopt political, social theory problems to the situation, because it's underneath the surface. Does that question make sense? So how do you have mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. repentance when it's still abstract, it's still unenacted? Right. Um, 
there are times when uh, rivers are calm and they look clean. But if you get enough wind and you give enough stirring of the water, you'll find out that on the bottom of the riverbed, there was a lot of junk that flows to the top. I think God allows a lot of what we're going through to get the junk that's deep down and abstract to flow to the top so we can see it. Because it's very easy when everything is calm and you have certain movements that appear to bring calmness that make people think things have changed. But let the waters be stirred a little bit and you'll find out that on the heart, the bottom riverbed of people's hearts is a lot of stuff that was hidden because everything appeared to be calm. It just flows to the top, but it's been there the whole time. So the, 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 the stirring up in our culture, I believe, is simply uh, an aspect where we're starting to see that the 60s and the civil rights movement and all these other movements really didn't solve the root of the problem because all this stuff keeps floating to the top every time something happens in the culture. Or it will remain abstract if you're not careful. Um, and then there's just, they're just uh, people who don't know that they have these issues. And that's very possible. I know some of my brethren of the African-American persuasion would disagree because they think everybody should know. But do we, did we all know all the sin we were doing and where the sin that we were doing before it became aware to us? We have blind spots. All of us have blind spots. And this can be a blind spot for some people. And I, and I dealt with this, and this is why this is my life story, and I understand these issues very well. There are guys at college who, who were, most of them were rural guys, and, and um, don't judge me, um, but I joined a fraternity on purpose. Um, I joined a fraternity uh, that was focused on athletics and sports. And I mean, athletics and academics. Um, um, because I knew very early that I was going to have to work in a world that was dominated by the majority culture. And I wanted to know what was behind the thinking of these guys, because I may have to work for some of these guys, or they may have to work for me one day. And so in doing that, um, I developed relationships, and I would have conversations about black, white, these kind of is fears, concerns. And one of the things that was very uh, prevalent is that most of these people have never interacted with anybody outside of their particular ethnic group. Um, and so most of them thought that all black people were like JJ on good times. You're funny, but you really ain't got no sense. And, until, and they would tell you, until we met you. And we met you, and you can put a sentence together, and you can put words together, and you're more than just athletic, and then blah, blah, blah. And, and, and um, there was one time they were having some kind of divisiveness in the meeting, and we had to pull a couple guys out because they were really getting ready to get at it. And, and uh, one of the guys, he says, I need to tell you something. Man, I hated black folk until I met you. And you changed my whole viewpoint about black people. And I think the, there was some conversation about who we were going to let in or something. And, and it had, so it had to spire off that because so, that's the only reason he would say that. And, and, uh, but it had always been my mission to change people's point of view about people. But that would have never happened if I had not taken the risk and the chance and the uncomfortableness of being the only black person in the fraternity. And I got a lot of things changed. I know they weren't going to give up their drinking. I didn't drink. But I, I knew they weren't going to give up their drinking. But I can say, can we collect keys at the door so that people don't leave here driving drunk? So we initiated that, initiated that as a policy. I said, rather than having these girls risk themselves and, and, and driving on, can we just collect keys at the door and possibly go pick them up and then drop them off so that they don't end up in a car crash? That's a good idea. But also, people would see me at the parties. They wouldn't see me drinking. They wouldn't see me chasing women. And it made some of them more comfortable because they didn't feel pressured by the other guys to do things they really weren't comfortable with because they saw me not doing it. 
See, we can have impact rather than vacating. We can be light and salt in the midst of darkness rather than vacating. And so, yeah, the people have a lot of this, and they don't, they don't understand it. They, don't, they just were raised that way. They just think that's the way it's always been until they meet somebody different. They, Wait a minute, I do have some issues. I do have some blind spots when it comes to this. And fortunately, there was a man they could come to, a young man they could come to that wasn't mad and wasn't going to tell them, you should be stupid, you should be no better and ask them kind of questions. No, no, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's, 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 here's why some of people who look like me might be offended by you saying that and you doing that and thinking that without me getting mad about it. That needs to happen on both sides. And what a better place for that to happen than in the body of Christ in the church. Where we're supposed to be one. So that's how I would answer that question. I'm I'm struggling with the the problem of finding insight into these things. And I think it rests largely on how we ask the question. And Mm -hmm. so I'm hoping I get the (laughs) <laughs> That's right. We'll figure it out as we go along. <laughs> I'm following you exactly with the cross and all that he did. And the issue of the Old Testament prophet saying God's going to give you a new heart. Ezekiel and Isaiah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that what Christ brings to us is something different from what we have known ourselves to be mm-hmm. and capable of. Mm-hmm. And you were right there in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God is being poured out of our hearts. What he's telling us to do in living out a Christ life is not something that comes from you. Correct. Would you, and I think the culture in which we live has deluded us into thinking that what that is is just a little further extension of what we were in terms of altruism and being kind and yeah. doing well. Would you expound a little bit on the difference between God's agape love mm-hmm. and everything else that we've got floating around the world today? Yeah. It seems like that is what makes all of this become real. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Very good question. Uh, you guys know the, the Greek term agape is, is basically two components. It's uh, sacrificial, and it's loving the other person more than I love myself. It's agape. It's what God has done to us. And that's the love that Romans is talking about is being poured out of. It's God's love. So we have to kind of change the way we think about things. It's not whether I can love that person. It's the question is, will I die so God can love that person through me? It's the empowerment of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit that, that needs to be manifest in my life because in my physical flesh, I can't do these things. I couldn't love that baseball coach in my flesh. You know, um, if I was fleshly, then I had friends who I grew up with who were counting on me to go to the major leagues so they could be my posse. We had posses before the modern people. You know, they could ride on the coattail. So when that was messed up for me, they saw it as being messed up for them. And I grew up, I told you I grew up in the inner city my first 12 years of my life, and and some of these people still call themselves, they were, I didn't consider us friends, but they were, and, and, the coach doesn't even know it. But some of these people didn't have good backgrounds. And they had no problem taking a ride to Maryville if I had just said the word. That man doesn't even know he and his friend wouldn't be alive today if I had just said the word. Because they didn't see him doing injustice to me so much as it was to them. 
and what they were expecting to benefit from by being associated with me. But agape love was the only thing I knew about. Even in my infantile Christian walk at that time, I knew that wasn't right. That wasn't God. But I'm here today to tell you, that man could be dead, and his whole family could have been wiped out like that because they would have rode in the car overnight and killed all of them and rode back to town or done some kind of physical harm to them. But it's the love of God. I mean, it, I can't explain it to you because I didn't even understand it myself at that time, that God was just doing something that just says, that's not who you are. And we're to reflect that same love towards sinners. It's the outworking of who we are. There was, yeah. there was nothing about you that was so good and so credible that God should have chose you for salvation. Nothing. Nothing. So salvation is not based on worth or ethnic identification. There was nothing about Israel that God should have chose Israel in the Old Testament. They were a little no-nothing people. And if you're going to choose someone, choose the Babylonians. That's a great power. But God sovereignly chose to shower his love and elect Israel as his nation. Nothing about worth. So therefore, if that's God's mentality towards that little know nothing, that's got to be my mentality towards my fellow brothers and sisters, enemies or the ungodly. If I'm going to claim that I'm a follower of Christ. Jesus showed this in John chapter 4, did he not? Jesus is a Jew, right? What does he do in John chapter 4? He goes through No, he could have took the Olive Loop highway and went around. No, but he intentionally did what? Went where Jews historically, traditionally do not go on purpose. Why? Because he knew sovereignly and providentially there was a woman that he needed to meet at the well who needed to hear the gospel. Now, Jesus had 12 guys with him, right? They weren't thinking what he was thinking. They were still thinking Jewish, right? Here's a lesson. Don't let other people who are still thinking sinfully about other people keep you from doing what you are supposed to do as a Christian. Jesus sent those guys off and did the ministry he came to do. Here's another thing for you pastors. It's nice if you bring somebody like me in and preach at your church and preach about this stuff. I've come. But listen to me. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 and following, when Peter showed his hypocrisy, Paul confronted him to his face publicly. You know one of the reasons why this issue has not been solved in the church? Because you guys who look like the guys and people who look like me are not confronting the Peters and their denominations and their churches. You'd rather bring the hired gun in, who they're just going to interpret me as a mad black man, the gunslinger, <laughs> when it would be even better if Paul would confront Peter and say, this is not right. How does the curse of Ham, which is not even in the Bible, get promoted in the churches and in seminaries and Bible colleges, and nobody leads a riot over that. 
That's one of the questions that my people have about you people. And I'm using phraseology that they're familiar with. I would never use that in talking to you. Hopefully you know that. But there's a problem. How does that go on for so long? How does that get taught? How do you go to Bible College Seminary, have good, sound, hermeneutical principles, and come out with the curse of Ham when it was Cain and not Ham who was cursed? And it's clear in the text. And teach that and promote that in seminaries Bible College so that they go out to their congregation and teach that same fallacy and heresy. How did you all let that go on for so long? And now Paul is now confronting Peter. Paul is now coming alongside Peter and teaching the same thing that Peter is teaching. These are issues that have kept this stuff going on for far too long in the church. And the reason why they did it, in case you don't know, is because we had to find something in the Bible that lined up with what the culture was saying so we didn't have to suffer if we took a different stand. So we came up with the curse of Ham, and the text is clear to say it was one of the sons of Ham, not Ham. I don't even have to be able to read to figure that out. But see, now all of Ham's descendants are meant to be slaves, so that's why black people should always be slaves to everybody else. And the church taught that for years, decades. And believed it. Darwinism, and, and this is all in my dissertation, Darwinism was a problem that caused a lot of this to be perpetuated. Um, fear, fear. Um, and uh, misapplication of scripture. Those are three aspects that have kept, continued to help this perpetuate in the church. Fear of losing my status. Fear of losing my position. Fear of losing our power and our position in the culture and in the world. Because if we make them all equals, then we are not relevant as a power base anymore. Fear. Fear of the unknown. If we all get together, then little Bobby going to start looking at little Bebe, and they're going to start falling in love, and they're going, no, we can't have us getting together and that happening. Fear. Next. You guys are thinking, aren't you? Wheels are turning, wheels are turning. This is how we got here. Uh, how, do you, how do we help, like, children and teens Understand this issue, but then also we just help them process when they witness injustices or sins in this area happen, whether to themselves or in cultural events, like even what happened this last summer with the rape versus suicide. Uh, how do we do yeah. that? Well, I think we need to start telling them the truth and start lying to them. You know, uh, my kids are by ethnic. Uh, they're human, so I don't say biracial. They're bi-ethnic. They have an African-American father and a Caucasian mother and uh, very well-balanced children. We taught, them, we taught them to have their identity in Christ and not in their ethnic makeup. That's what we taught them. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a child of the king. You are a co-equal heir to all that God has an inheritance for us as the people of God. That's your identity. And, and my kids, we, you know, our kids, we live in an urban context, but we sent them to school at a suburban school because we wanted to get a good education because I think education is important. Um, when my kids were coming up, it's a little bit different because I think things were a little more volatile, volatile than when they were going to school. They didn't have these issues. I mean, they, there was all kinds of people in their school. And, and one of the things my wife and I tried to figure out, why are they hugging each other all the time? 
Just some of the huggiest people we've ever seen. I mean, just hugging each other. Get off my daughter. You don't know her. They're just, son, why are you hugging all these different girls? And it didn't matter what ethnic group they were from. Just the huggiest people. I don't know. What, what, is there something that got in the water? And this, I don't understand or what? But it, this, 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 this thing was not as much of an issue when my, got, my kids were going to school in the 90s and early 2000s as it is now because of all the hatred that is being spewed, because there's a lot of misconception. There's a lot of, the media has more influence than parents do. You know? And so what we did in, answer, in answering that question is we just taught our kids who they were in Christ. And anybody who doesn't accept you or who at Christ accepts you, you don't really want anything to do with anyway. And if Christ loved you enough to die for you, let that be enough for you. And your mama and daddy love you. That's really all you need in the essence of things. And our church family loved them. That's really all you need. And so that's what we do. That's what we taught our kids. And so this was never an issue for them growing up. Uh, I mean, they they had all three worlds. You know, my kids, and this, this is why I understand the relationship building and the exposure to the different cultures is so important. We live in an urban context, inner city. You will hear police cars and fire trucks up and down the street all night long. My family lives in a suburban community in Florissant, so you can go there, ride your bikes around the whole subdivision, and ain't nobody going to bother you. But then they also had my wife's side of the family, you out in the country. Country, country. And so you go up there, and, and there's a work ethic they learned. Because when they went up there for summer vacations, they didn't go up there vacation. You go up there and go work. You out in the field holding beans. You driving a tractor. You're helping Grandpa uh, dig holes to put posts in. So they learned work up there. They played when they went to my family's house in the suburb. They were protected when they came home because it's not as safe. So they were exposed to these different context and different cultures. And we believe that helped them to be very well-rounded. And they had a church family that just loved them to death. You know, I protected my kids and my wife. And I, and I, and if you haven't figured out now, I'm pretty honest about things. Uh, I, I made it clear to the church, my wife don't play the piano and she don't do nursery. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that's a qualification for a pastor's wife. She's my wife first, first lady second. Now, she'll serve, but she'll serve according to her gifts and her abilities. We're not following these traditional labors of what a pastor wife should be because it's not in here. Are you following what I'm saying? Takes the pressure off. And my kids are not angels. Let's just help you all understand. If you see them doing something they shouldn't be doing, feel free to correct them or bring them to us. But they're not angels. So don't be putting these false expectations on my kids and your kids run around and act like baby kids and detention center kids. Don't do that. Many of pastor kids have hated church and God as a result of that kind of treatment. And I learned from people who came before me, hey, you, you need to protect your family because the church won't protect them always. So we never had any, I've never had any of these issues with our kids in our family, because I learned from people who have gone before me from their mistakes. And, and our, we have a church family that just loves our kids and have loved our kids. They're, our kids are their kids. Their kids are my kids. We're family. And so I have a lot of kids that I never birthed. I had nothing to do with their birth, but they're my kids. They're, you know, and we're just that, that's kind of the close-knit family type of environment we have. And that's Caucasian and Hispanic and African Americans. That's the way we all feel about each other. And anything that comes out of people's mouths and mindset, even as we're getting new people, I don't have to say a thing. Our people jump on that. We don't tolerate that kind of worldly mentality up in here. Because we've taught them that. And now they practice that. So I don't even have to get involved. They take care of all that stuff. I never even hear about it until after it's over. That's a healthy church. 
That's a healthy immune system. You know, immune system is supposed to attack things before you know you're sick. A church that loves like that will deal with things before it ever becomes a problem and makes the church sick. Well, I think we've uh, reached the end of the hour. It went by fast. It goes by fast. We only got eight questions in, but it was awesome. So, hey, uh, let's let's uh, just give Dr. Clay a uh, round of, of thanks. <laughs> If I can be of any service to you, I have cards up here. I'll, hey, I have car, will travel, have plane, will get on, will whatever. I'll, I'll, if I can help the body of Christ anyway, he has some please call uh, me. literature back here on the table too, just for his Facebook page and things like that. So, just want to really thank you, Dr. Clay, for coming up. It, it's been good to get to know you, and and uh, hopefully this is just the beginning of a of a, a long term relationship we can have. So, um, thank you for coming, and I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. But uh, it's good. I think you're. I think all of us, uh, at one point in the in the uh, your presentations, saw some areas where we need to work on things, and so that's it's been good to be not only challenged and see what the multi-ethnic bride of the church should look like, but then what can we do, whether we're in a leadership role or a layperson, whatever that might be, what what can we do to help enact that? And and so it's good to kind of put those things in practice. So let's not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. So. Let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we do have a new identity in Christ and that, um, while earthly distinctions don't go away, we do know that our, our identity is completely in Christ. And I thank you, Father, that uh, you don't show partiality. Um, we thank you that we can come to you and that you treat us with infinite value and that you love us. Help us, Father, to turn around and to love others with that same type of love and uh, to try to create and be part of a disciple-making church that reaches all people um, and, and shares the gospel with everyone. Father, uh, thank you for Dr. Clay. Give him safety as he goes home. Help everybody here as they travel just to have safety and uh, help us to be able to, to mull these things over and that it would make a difference not only in our lives, but our church's lives as well. I pray this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.